Thank you for coming to the first Humanities Forum meeting of the year. Uh, many, of you are, many of you are familiar faces. Welcome back. Uh, many of you are new students. Welcome to your first Humanities Forum, or as uh, some people say, your first extra credit opportunity. Um, it's a great event, and I hope you'll look at the Humanities Forum schedule. It's one where we've brought uh, a lot of people to the Humanities Forum over now something like eight years. I think this is our eighth year of the Humanities Forum. Uh, and we have had a wide range of people come. Today, uh, the Humanities Forum is proud to welcome David Pettigrew to come speak to us on the question of what philosophers should, should say about genocide. David Pettigrew comes to us with a very interesting career trajectory. Um, he is a professor of philosophy at Southern Connecticut State University in New Haven, where he teaches a course on the Holocaust and genocide studies. He also serves as a member of the steering committee of the Yale University Genocide Studies Program. He lectures and writes about the genocide in Bosnia to raise awareness, resist denial, and ensure that the victims will not be forgotten. In 2018, his book chapter, The Suppression of Cultural Memory and Identity in Bosnia and Herzegovina, appeared in Multidisciplinary Perspectives on Genocide and Memory. In, two, in 2020, his article, A Mandate Interrupted, The Problematic Legacy of the International Criminal Tribunal in the Former Yugoslavia, appeared in Washington University's Global Studies Law Review. Like so many professors, he has, he has written, edited, translated scores of, no uh, scores of novels, scores of books. Remember that freshman, a novel and a book are not the same. Keep, keep it in mind, it gets circled. Scores of books um, and is co-editor of a book series on contemporary French thought published by SUNY. He is the vice president of the Connecticut Academy of Arts and Sciences, the third oldest learned society in the United States, something no, but good to learn, and was appointed to the Connecticut Department of Education Holocaust and Genocide Education um, Advisory Committee to assist schools in implementing the Connecticut, uh, Connecticut Holocaust and Genocide Education and Awareness Act of 2018. What makes him so different, though, from all the people we've, not all the people, but most of the people we have, is most of the people we have are going to be defined by their academic interest and their publication records. Um, they are part of the academy, and they're doing things that are sort of typical of the academy. David Pettigrew's story is different. He's very much, because of his interest in this question of genocide, outward facing. He's bringing the academy and what we learn in your two philosophy required classes and your civ classes and bringing to bear on really important questions. Questions like what should we think about genocide? What should we think about what's going on in the Ukraine? What should we think about what's going on in the world? His unique perspective is one that's going to be really valuable and with that I am very happy to welcome him to the Providence College Humanities Forum. If you can join me in welcoming David Pettigrew. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, how's, my, how's my sound? Good, thank you. Well, thanks so much to uh, Professors uh, Hain and to Professor Breen and his colleagues. Uh, for inviting me uh, and making all the arrangements so I could participate in Providence College Humanities Forum. Uh, thanks to uh, Pam Belcher for all, all the practical arrangements. We appreciate it. Uh, and uh, also thanks for inviting me to address this, this question, which I probably don't have an answer to, what, what philosophers should say about uh, genocide but it's, it's, it's cer certainly something to reflect on. Uh, and I was, I was just talking to Professor Breen right before, before the, the session, and he was telling me that you have a, a, a three-semester 
interdisciplinary uh, core requirement, which sounded so, so interesting. I'm, I'm impressed that Providence College makes this uh, commitment to, uh, to interdisciplinary liberal arts and uh, uh, thinking about, also thinking about social issues and social justice. So I, th I thought that if uh, whoever you would be speaking to, especially a philosopher, uh, it would be important to begin with the definition of genocide. And following Raphael Le Lemkin's coining of the term and his publication of the term in his book in 1944, the, 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 word, was, the word was soon entered into Merriam-Webster Dictionary. And I, I was reading ab about other, other uh, dictionaries around the world, other languages around the world that adopted uh, the word, the word became official, and and he lobbied the uh, UN UN representatives tirelessly, tirelessly to pass the law against genocide. So first, the resolution was approved, December 1948, and then the resolution had to be uh, voted on by member states. Uh, they, they had to have two thirds of the member states agree. It's like a treaty. Right? And by J January 1951, two-thirds of the member states signed on. And the, the following, uh, so the following excerpt is from the Genocide Convention, Article 2. Uh, quote, in the, in the present convention, genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such. So that's the, uh, and, and, uh, the following acts, I, I'm just listing two of them, uh, of, of the, I think there's five of them, but one is killing members of the group, and the other is uh, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. So that might be something like a siege of a, uh, of, of a town, when people, then people can't get food or medical supplies or um, heating, heating fuel. Uh, so Lemkin, who, who coined the word genocide and championed its ultimate inscription in international law, wrote in uh, his book, Axis, Rule, and Occupied Europe, that genocide has two phases. One, the destruction of the national pattern of the oppressed group. He called it the national pattern. Uh, and we, we can think about what that means. And the other phase is the imposition of the national pattern of the oppressor. And with, with respect to this, uh, this pattern, this idea of a pattern, uh, he's thinking of uh, this so, so, social, social structures. The destruction of the national pattern in the social field is accomplished in part by the abolition of local law, local courts, imposition of the oppressor's law and courts by the, per, by the perpetrators. As regards the cultural dimension, Lemkin specified the repression of the language, the control of cultural activities, the destruction of national monuments and archives. So I wanted to try to emphasize this cultural dimension of genocide in, in Lemkin's uh, description, as, as, as we'll run into it later today in our discussion. At, because I think most people think of genocide as, the, as, the, as uh, eliminationist, extermination, which, which, which it is, but it also has this cultural dimension. At any rate, there's much to be considered <laughs> regarding Lemkin's remarkable coining of the term genocide, a hybrid word combining the Greek genos and Latin sede. One cannot overstate the transformative impact of the word, which enables the indictment, prosecution, and conviction for genocide. Uh, I was thinking about the uh, uh, cables, cables from, uh, from Henry Morgenthau from Constantinople in 1915 when he's telling the State Department that, that something's happening, what we would call today the Armenian genocide is underway, but the, he didn't have the word genocide to refer to. So he refers to it by the only terminology he, he has at the time. You know what, what he said? It was, a, it was a campaign of race extermination, quote unquote, race extermination. And so this was the, this was the term. Uh, later, in 1971, when the Bangladesh genocide was in, was in progress, the, 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 the consulate in, in Dhaka 
in East Pakistan, which no longer exists. Can't find it on the map. Uh, it, it is now it's, it's in Bangladesh. Uh, the, 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 the staff of the consulate wrote a cable to the State Department. There was a dissent cable in which they, they said that US foreign policy was morally bankrupt and that genocide was in progress. So they had the word. They could use it. But at, at, in 1915, they didn't have the word until, until Lemkin coins it, champions its inscription in, in law so people can be indicted, prosecuted, and, and convicted. And we, we can talk about that. But I also wanted to emphasize Article 1 of the Genocide Convention as part of which the contracting parties confirmed that genocide, uh, whether committed in time of peace or in time of war, is a crime which they undertake to prevent and punish. So the signatories to that, to that uh, treaty, to that international law, uh, agreed to try to prevent genocide. The International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda had a, a slogan which was against impunity. This meant that genocide and other war crimes should be prosecuted so that one would not be able to assume in our world that they could commit genocide or other war crimes with impunity. So, so the punishment or convictions with prison sentences can be seen as a strategy for prevention. Potential perpetrators would think uh, about spending the rest of their lives in prison, before, presumably before they would carry out a genocide. So, so prevention seems like an important topic, if not a priority. But, but prosec prosecutions happen after the fact. How can we prevent genocide before it happens? Now, this is just a quick reflection that in 2018, Connecticut passed the Connecticut Holocaust and Genocide Awareness, Education and Awareness Act, and it required Holocaust and Genocide Education and Awareness in, in, in curriculum in social studies grades K through 12 in the public schools. Uh, there had been many efforts to pass that law for about a decade before they finally did it. And uh, there was an event that occurred that precipitated its, its passage in 2018. Can anybody guess what it was? Uh, it was uh, Charlottesville. And, and this is what a Connecticut legislator suggested to me. He said, well, you know, it was because of Charlottesville that we were finally motivated to do this. Uh, and uh, there was, because in Charlottesville, there was something called a Unite the Right rally that included neo-Nazis and white supremacists. And the marchers actually chanted, as they, were, as they were carrying torches, they chanted that Jews will not replace us. So following the uh, passage of the law in Connecticut, I was appointed to this advisory committee to provide guidance to, to teachers, to, I guess, to also talk to the Department of Ed Education about what we thought was possible, what should be priorities, and then to do uh, uh, workshops with teachers. I, I noted that, that Rhode Island has a similar law. I don't know how many of you are actually from Rhode Island, but Rhode, or you're coming, coming to Rhode Island just to go to college. But they, they, it was, they, they implemented a, a similar law in Rhode Island uh, earlier, maybe 2016. So I thought that was interesting. I was hoping to follow up on that, because on the website, it looks like they talk about some genocides and not others. So I'd be interested to see how they made that decision. But when I was attending those meetings uh, <clears throat> with this advisory committee, I discovered my interest in prevention was, not, was, was one that others didn't share. <clears throat> They were not opposed to it, but they, it wasn't a priority for them. My colleagues wanted to raise awareness that the Holocaust and genocide happened, which, of course, is very important. But, and as I recall, it took some discussion to include prevention in our rationale posted on the Connecticut Department of Education website. But I, I, was, and I was sort of wondering, what was my motivation for focusing on genocide prevention? It could be that I've been involved in human rights advocacy in a post-genocide society, where my analysis has been that there are signs that the genocidal ideology is continuing in certain ways and the genocide can happen again. But it's also possible my philosophical background might also play a role in, 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 in the sense of my study of Aristotle. Here I should say Aristotle. Yes, Aristotle. In physics, too, 
book, book two, chapters one through four, Aristotle sets forth a discussion of four causes, efficient, material, formal, and final. I don't know if you get to that uh, this year or in the, in the future. And for Aristotle to know something, to know the truth about something, is to know the cause or, or causes. So perhaps my extrapolation from Aristotle had, has been that if we understand the causes of genocide, we can intervene, mitigate, or prevent. Certainly, genocide is one of the most pressing human problems for our time. After the Holocaust, when we, we said, never again, we had Bangladesh genocide in 71, Cambodian genocide from 75 to 79, Bosnian genocide, 92 to 95, genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda, 1994, and other, other mass atrocity crimes that have been investigated as genocide. Darfur, Rohingya, in Myanmar, the Uyghur, in China, uh, mass atrocity events in Syria, Ukraine, with genocidal dimensions. The, the possibility of prevention was also the motivation behind the formation of the Atrocities Prevention Board in the Obama White House. The, fir the first director was Samantha Power. Uh, you're probably reading her book, um, uh, Problem from Hell, America in the Age of Genocide, if I'm remembering the title. So what, what then are sort of primary causes of genocide that can be known and support efforts at prevention. Let me give you an example. For example, hate speech can be identified as a cause in a number of genocides because it dehumanizes or demonizes the targeted other and renders them vulnerable to harm. Hate speech incites and authorizes violence against the group. Armenians were referred to as tubercular microbes. Jews were referred to as a bacillus by Himmler. Tutsis in Rwanda were referred to as inyenzi, or cockroaches. And Bo Bosnian Muslims were referred to as, as Turks, which motivated the perpetrators, sparking a sense of having been victimized by the Ottoman Empire. So hate speech works in different ways in, in, in the, the context. Uh, another cause would be how the way elected politicians or party leaders use hate speech or hateful ideology to manipulate the public, inciting fear, hatred of one group or the other. One, one example I wanted to use was the example of Leon Mugacera, who was found guilty. So he, he uh, engaged in documented hate speech in Rwanda and fled to Canada. But in, in Canada, they eventually uh, uh, prosecuted him for hate speech, convicted him, and uh, de deported him or extradited him to Rwanda, where he was tried again for hate speech and, and found guilty of public incitement to commit genocide, persecution as a crime against humanity, and inciting ethnic-affiliated hatred. And he was sentenced to life in prison. So referring to the Tutsi in Rwanda, Mugacera asserted that Quote, we, the people, are obliged to take responsibility ourselves to wipe out this scum. So this was his, his uh, statement at, at a political rally. He stated that the law had mandated death to the accomplices of the cockroaches. He insisted Tutsi families should be decimated and encouraged operations to eliminate the Tutsis. So this is just one, one example of a hate speech wielded by a politician trying to incite uh, hatred and genocide. Another, another cause, I just have a few that I wanted to mention today, uh, is the propagation of hateful speech or ideology through media. Two examples from Rwanda included the, a newspaper publication, Kangura newspaper, and one of the, one of the uh, memorable issues of that newspaper had a, a, an image of a machete on the cover. And, and, the, and the caption said, this is how we deal with the you know, Tutsi cockroaches. So there, that was seen as an incitement. And another, another was the RTLM radio, uh, radio call them announcers, exhorting listeners to kill cockroaches, saying the graves were not yet full. 
And uh, they said, we're almost, in one broadcast, they said, we're, we're more than halfway there. The, gra the graves are not yet full. So the, the radio is you know, driving the genocide. The officials at both Kangura and RTLM were convicted of inciting, instigating, and aiding and abetting genocide as part of the proceedings at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. In Rwanda, in 1992, it was the radio. But today, it can be Facebook and Twitter. So that's interesting that both, both platforms have, in the past year, developed uh, policies on, new policies on hate speech in relation to Holocaust and genocide denial. I, I only know that in some detail because a, uh, a publication contacted me and asked me to comment on that. And I said, well, that's interesting. I had to look it up and found that it was absolutely true that they had developed this. Originally, they thought that uh, Facebook thought that Holocaust denial fell you know, under freedom of speech, but then they recognized that it was part of, part of a, a kind of broader, uh, broader spectrum of hate speech that was inciting further anti-Semitism. So, uh, okay. Another cause uh, emphasized by Samantha Power in her book, Problem from Hell, A Problem from Hell, is uh, the failure of intervention, failure of specifically US intervention. And she gives a number of very, very uh, telling examples of the, the US uh, in the Armenian genocide declaring neutrality at the time. Uh, and in the Rwanda genocide, she has some incredible details from uh, internal communications in the Defense Department and the State Department, where uh, one, one office said that they would not interdict the insightful radio broadcast due to the American commitment to free speech. So we ra rationalized le letting the radio continue. And the other uh, said that one office rationalized that, that ethnic flare-ups were normal for the region. So it's just what, how people are going to behave, which is a kind of, uh, I would argue, a blatantly racist assumption. So lar largely due to the failure of intervention in Bosnia and Rwanda, the UN developed a new doctrine of intervention, new doctrine of intervention, referred to as the responsibility to protect, R2P. The last cause I, I will, I'll mention, which may be less obvious, hopefully it's interesting, uh, the last cause of genocide, Important for prevention is that of genocide denial. Gregory Stanton's 10 stages of genocide, 10 stages of genocide include genocide denial as the 10th stage, which is seen as the surest indicator of a repetition of the atrocities. By denying the atrocities, whether genocide or other war crimes, the crime is dismissed, trivialized, or justified, rendering the victims vulnerable to a repetition. The awareness of the, the danger of, den of denial led countries in Europe to enact laws criminalizing Holocaust denial and eventually genocide denial. The German Criminal Code, for example, uh, Section 130, I, I must mention that subsequently, criminalizes Holocaust denial. denial. Holocaust denial is seen as a kind of hate speech an assault on the dignity of the victims, a verbal assault that, again, renders the, 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 the victims, the survivors, susceptible to a repetition of the atrocities. The, the, the title of Section 130 is called The Incitement of the Masses. The code criminalizes disturbance of peace that incites hatred against a national, racial, or religious group defined by their ethnic origin, uh, and calls for violence or arbitrary measures against them. And, it, and it, specifically in terms of uh, the Holocaust, it says whoever publicly or in a meeting, so this is like a sub, subsection amended to this uh, code on incitement, whoever publicly disturbs the public peace in a matter which violates the dignity of the victims by approving, glorifying, or justifying national socialist tyranny, national socialism, 
An arbitrary rule incurs a penalty of imprisonment for a term not exceeding three years or a fine. Well, that's also interesting, the three-year prison term. So this, this way of thinking about uh, denial as inflammatory hate speech has evolved in the EU, and a conceptual framework for legislation criminalizing denial can be found in the Council of the European Union Framework Decision of 28 November 2008. So I guess, in, in, in a sense, that's relatively recent, 2008. Uh, and it's, it's a framework on combating expressions of racism and xenophobia by means of criminal law. And it indicates that member, member states shall ensure that publicly condoning, denying, or grossly trivializing crimes of genocide is punishable. Switzerland passed a law like this you know, before, the, before the framework decision in, in 1995, but Belgium's, Belgium's law came in 2019. And there, there are other, other countries that are, that are passing laws. So what, what the laws share is the idea that the denial of a genocide is intrinsically an act of hatred and discrimination since it minimizes or justifies barbaric crimes suffered by the targeted group and it entails a threat that the crime could be repeated. Uh, so it, it, it seems to me that we might not be attuned with the potentially negative consequences of denial as hate speech. So I thought at this point of the lecture it would be helpful to reflect on one specific example from the recent genocide in Bosnia, as part of which denial, hate speech, media propaganda all become part of a causal, causal matrix as part of which denial permeates the culture, escalating and engendering the phenomenon of triumphalism, a celebration of the genocide. So now it's not denied, it's, it's celebrated. Uh, and, threat, and its recurrence is threatened. Triumphalism is a term that was coined by a, a colleague of mine, a Bosnian genocide survivor and scholar, Haris Halilovic. Some people are calling it now the 11th stage of genocide, you know, working with Greg Stanton's 10, ten stages. So just for, this is just to give you a brief context. Uh, let's see, we have, we have that. So just a brief context of related to atrocities committed in Bosnia and Herzegovina by the Army of Republika Srpska from 1992 to 1995 that were judged to be genocide and other war crimes by the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and the International Court of Justice. The Dayton Peace Agreement uh, in 1995 established two entities within the sovereign nation of, of Bosnia. So this is the former Yugoslavia. You can see, you can see Bosnia. And within, within Bosnia, there are uh, there's the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina and Republika Srpska. So these are almost like uh, states within. You know, it's like Connecticut and Massachusetts, side by side, as part of the United States, except that, uh, or, or, or should I say, Connecticut and Rhode Island, side by side, as part of, as though they would be part of one country. In this case, they're uh, part of, they're part of, you know, Bosnia. Each, each, there's, there's a national parliament. Each one, each one has its own entity, entity assembly for the entity. Uh, and the... The founding leadership of Republika Srpska, which was recognized at the, at the peace treaty, the founding leadership uh, of Republika Srpska were convicted of genocide and other war crimes on appeal based on the documented atrocities. So I have some photographs which are, uh, uh, which are representative of some of, the, some of the documented atrocities. So one is from the Omarska concentration camp now we're talking about 1992. These are, these are buildings, uh, like photographs I've taken of these buildings from recent visits. Uh, so well, this, this is the White House at Omarska where, where prisoners were, were getting special treatment, being tortured and, tortured and killed. <clears throat> the White House at Omarska, this was the, uh, uh, the main detention facility and that's the main, the main facility. And then the canteen 
where the pe the people receive the daily ration, of soup and bread, or uh, and also there were uh, interrogations and, and violence in and the second floor of this building. So Nopoye concentration camp was also in this area, and uh, people were. This was a, 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 a detention site uh, where people were uh, mistreated. It's renovated, renovated now, and uh, it was also, so the Trinopoli concentration camp included uh, the, the cultural center and also the school. This was the, the local school, and it's now, again, a school, which is an interesting phenomenon that we'll hopefully have time to talk about, where the, form, the school is once again a school. Uh, this was a... Uh, Another concentration camp in the area, Keraterm. It was a ceramics factory. And this is uh, in the other side of Bosnia, or no, this is Kalinovic, uh, an area where, the, again, most people were kept in the elementary school, but then some men were selected for uh, transfer to this building before they were executed. So this is a former former site, and in Visegrad, you had uh, people murdered on this, this famous bridge. In Visegrad, the Mehmet Pasha Sokolovic bridge from the 1500s. And, uh, and then women, women and children and elderly were forced into these two houses and burned alive. Uh, the, the perpetrators were convicted of extermination as a crime against humanity and sentenced to, one was sentenced to life, the other for 30, 30 years. That's Bikovac. The house was destroyed in the process. And uh, there, there was the siege of Sarajevo. We were talking about sieges earlier. So uh, I, di I didn't, so I selected photographs that, that wouldn't be too jarring or disturbing. This, this is something in, that they do in Sarajevo. They uh, preserve the impact crater with, these, with uh, this red epoxy, and they call these Sarajevo roses. So in the, in the course of over four years, more than 11,000 civilians were, were murdered through shelling and, uh, and sniper fire, and also through the siege conditions, through uh, starvation or the lack, lack of, of heat and so forth. So th this is this is in a, you know, a a city street. Now, what do we have here? That's just a close up. But uh, wh where this happened, they have plaques to mark the date. This was like May tw May twenty seventh, nineteen ninety. Can't make it out. And it says 20, 26 people were were killed. Uh, and then below, below, uh, I don't have it in the photograph. They have you'd have the names of the victims. So this was uh, there's a memorial for the children, over a thousand children who were killed during the siege. Uh, their names, their, their names are on this uh, these cylinders, which I, maybe I can talk about them later. Uh, and Srebrenica was the location of atrocities where were around 8,372 men and boys were murdered in a matter of days around July, between July 11th and July 15th in 1995. Uh, so they have, uh, every, every year there's a commemorative uh, funeral, collect, collective burial and, comm comm and commemoration of the genocide. So these are victims whose Human remains have been identified. They're still in the process of identifying human remains because the, the perpetrators, uh, so this is the cemetery on July 11th when they're ready, preparing for this collective uh, funeral or a janaza. And, uh, but but the, the reason we're still finding and identifying human remains is that the perpetrators hid, hid the victims in mass graves and then when, when there was a, uh, when, word, when word reached the UN Security Council about the mass graves, they, uh, they, they, the perpetrators moved 
those graves to other sites. And in the process, the victims' uh, bodies were disarticulated. So they, there's a process of reassociation that goes on. And you find pieces in different places. And this, this was a secondary mass grave. So these are, these are just uh, some documentation of, of, uh, of documented atrocities. And, uh, but, but, but the leadership of Republika Srpska today routinely denies the genocide and other atrocities. The denial is painful for the survivors, for example, elderly women who lost members of their families, who, some whose human remains have not been identified, who are they're re-traumatized by the denial. And you could say the denial impedes justice and reconciliation. Discussions of transitional or restorative justice required for reconciliation and state building suggests that perpetrators would need to accept responsibility and acknowledge the suffering. But denial in Bosnia has been accompanied by the glorification of those who, convicted, who were convicted of genocide and other war crimes. So survivors are literally surrounded by statues, plaques, murals, and so forth, glorifying convicted war criminals. The effect of the heroization of war criminals trivializes the suffering of the victims and justifies the genocide. Now, I was involved in uh, encouraging the high representative who oversees the, the peace agreement to impose a law against genocide denial, uh, which involved writing letters to him and meeting with him. And in July 2021, he finally implemented the law against genocide denial and against the glorification of convicted war criminals. So this was a historic decision reasserting the importance of something we call the rule of law. But in a sense, it was too late, because the glorification of war criminals over the course of two decades since 95 have taken you know, root in the culture, uh, leading to what I referred to earlier, this phenomenon of tri triumphalism. The glorification of war criminals was already a form of, of denial. So uh, I have some uh, images here of of uh, examples to give you some idea. So this is a banner downtown Bratunac, the next town over from Srebrenica. And it says, happy birthday, Sretan Rojendan. And the image is over here. It's hard to see, but it's uh, the Serb member of the presidency of Republika Srpska. I'm uh, sorry, I, I apologize. Serb member of the presidency of, of Bosnia. They have a tripartite presidency with one from each of the three main ethnic groups. This was determined by the peace agreement. And this is uh, Milorad Dodik. So he's, it's his birthday. It's also the birthday of Ratko Mladic. This is Ratko Mladic on the, on the right, who was convicted of genocide for Srebrenica. First instance verdict on appeal and sentenced to life in, in prison. And uh, it's also interesting, if we had time, we could talk about the, you see the street sign. It's in uh, Cyrillic because this is in Republika Srpska and, and to kind of assert ethnic difference, ethnic purity, ethnic superiority to using Cyrillic letters. When traditionally Bosnia, uh, Serbo-Croatian, the language was had something called synchronic digraphia, two, two alphabets. So this, but this is one. It says uh, Sarajevo, Pala, and Zvornik. Oh, so we have. Uh, this, this was posted in uh, Srebrenica on July 11th when we're having the collective burial. And, it's, and it's, uh, it says uh, July 11th uh, is uh, it's a, it's a day of uh, Sreben a liberation of Srebrenica. So it's not the genocide, it's a liberation. Here's, this is in Focha. The, the Kreshnik verdict said you know, that really all traces of Bosnian Muslim presence were eliminated from Focha, a kind of cultural genocide. And this is, again, Ratko Mladic on, uh, on, on the street. And this is the entrance, the entrance to Kalinovic, which is uh, the area in which he lived where you're, you're greeted by this mural of Ratko Mladic. And it says, the town of the hero. Grad, hero, hero, 
Eroya. Hmm. That's a uh, Kalinovic. And let's see, this is, this is the uh, hill above Sarajevo in a position from which the citizens were attacked for four years. It's a plaque commemorating Ratko Mladic. And also the army of Republika Srpska. So this is Ratsa Hill. This is a dormitory that was dedicated to Radovan Karadzic, the president of Republika Srpska, who was convicted of genocide, sentenced to life in prison. So it's, uh, and this is, we saw this earlier, I think, it's Ternopolye, but I didn't show you earlier the uh, memorial in front for the, the, the brave, it's the, the brave uh, fighters whose bodies laid the foundation of Republika Srpska. So the perpetrators are being glorified at the site of the concentration camp. This is in Visegrad. Uh, to the brave defenders of Republika Srpska from the grateful citizens of Visegrad. So this isn't for one uh, individual convicted war criminal, but in general, for the, the it's more, more general, I, I think it'd be interesting, it'd be difficult to prosecute. It's a series of memorials by Mildrag Zivkovic, again, uh, glorifying, usually it's the fighters or defenders of Republika Srpska. These are massive, massive, uh, you have this motif of people coming out of the cross. This is the, the Serb defenders of Birchko and so forth. And uh, maybe bringing us back to the Ukraine, we had uh, in 2015, the United Kingdom introduced a resolution in the UN Security Council trying to simply remember the Srebrenica genocide. And it was, it was uh, vetoed, vetoed by the uh, UN ambassador representing the Russian Federation, Vitaly Churkin. And, and the memorial reads, Spasi Boza Ruskoye Nyet, thanks for the Russian no. So this is the, uh, so. What is to be done in the, in, the, in the face of such cruelty and hate when, when the uh, plaque for Ratko Mladic was installed on that, on that wall in Ratsa, Ratsa Hill in the position from which the citizens of Sarajevo had been attacked for four years. Had been attacked for four years. Uh, I spoke to a receptionist at my hotel about it. I think at the time I was trying to find it. And she said, almost without thinking, she said, provocatia, provocation. So what, what I'm thinking about today is you know, how to respond to these provocations. And one, one way to respond is to have a, uh, to such hate is to have a strategy for transitional justice in a post-genocide society, including judicial and non-judicial remedies. One can advocate for the right to memorialization as a mode of ensuring the truth is asserted and preserved for the future. Memorialization is seen by UN documents as a form of reparation. There was a UN resolution just in January 2022 that condemned Holocaust denial and commended UN member states who have preserved Holocaust concentration camps in order to educate future generations. I, I, I'm thinking of, uh, they must be thinking of Auschwitz, for example. You can go to Auschwitz to remember the victims and be educated. In order to prevent all this, to prevent the repetition of the atrocities. But in Republika Srpska, while such denial and hate are prevalent, survivors are prohibited from or strongly discouraged from installing memorials to the victims. So you saw these statues and memorials and banners and plaques and so forth, um, murals, but, but the survivors are either completely prohibited or strongly discouraged from installing memorials for the, the victims at, say, at the site of uh, former concentration camps. Elie Wiesel wrote eloquently of the ethical dimensions of remembering the victims of the Holocaust. To forget, he insisted, would be not only dangerous but offensive. To forget the dead would be akin to killing them a second time. 
And he, he asserted, moreover, that memory was a matter of justice. Justice without memory is incomplete justice, he said. False and unjust. To forget, to forget would be an absolute injustice. To forget would be the enemy's final triumph. So I wanted to think today, uh, depending on how much time we have, you know, about uh, our responsibility to remembering victims in the face of denial and the suppression of cultural memory. One way to think about that is in terms of, of a human right that is not, not well known, or not, not, not well studied, but it's the right to the truth. Uh, the human right to the truth is, fu is, a fundamental, is fundamental to the inherent dignity of the human person. Uh, and it has a societal dimension Society has the right to know the truth about past events concerning the perpetration of heinous crimes, as well as the circumstances and the reasons for which aberrant crimes came to be committed, so that such events do not reoccur in, in the future. So one, one, one could infer that with the social dimension of the human right to the truth, there seems to be a logical need for memorial mechanisms to preserve and convey that truth to this and future generations. So it seems that these human right documents that I'm, I'm summarizing now would support the right to memorialization as part of our right to the truth to prevent the repetition of the crimes and to prevent re-traumatization. So uh, if, I wanted to say a little bit, if we have time, about the, uh, what philosophy would, 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 would suggest about this. And it's uh, Immanuel Kant provides in his book, The Groundwork of a Metaphysics of Morals, a way to think about our obligation to the rights and dignity of the other and the, uh, the obligation to treat others always as ends in themselves, uh, not, not, to, not to treat people simply as a means to an end, to, but to recognize that of the, um, of the other that is like pure purposiveness. And it was the, so this is about the dignity of the human being based on, on reason. Uh, I, and I'm just recalling with you that the, the German criminal code spoke of Holocaust denial as a violation of the dignity of the human being. In other words, reason tells us we should not exploit others by treating them as a means to an end, but always as, uh, oh, oh, but, but, but such respect for the other on the basis of reason may not tell us about caring, being with, about empathy, and remembering the victims. Sartre's existentialism is a humanism, comes to mind. For Sartre, we are responsible for everything we do. He says we're, we're nothing more than the sum of our actions. Outside ourselves, like when you come into existence, you're somehow activated outside of yourself in the world with others, defined by a commitment or as Sartre writes, condemned in our freedom to choose. And when we're choosing, we're choosing the world in which we exist with others. Camus in The Plague, I don't know if you're still reading this book in high school or college, but thematizes our responsibility to the community in several aspects of the novel. It's, and it's a sense of, of restoring human values that have, be, uh, that have become exhausted in a place like Iran in the modern world. Raymond Rambert, having been obsessed with escaping quarantine, ultimately resolves to stay for the good of the community to help Dr. Rue. Uh, at some point, he, he says, I, you know, I've decided my place is here with you. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. But it's an important moment in, in, in the novel. With, with Levinas, I wanted to bring in Levinas because with Levinas, uh, there's a kind of response to the limitations of rationality, thinking, decision-making, character in it with Aristotle, is with Levinas, we're radically responsible for the, for the other. This is always already the case. We're not a thinking thing, as with Descartes, but it, we, we're responsible as we exist, and we're exposed to the call or need of the other, and that you know, call is infinite. We're always, always responsible. I'm always responsible, uh, and and I and I and it's it's a non-reciprocal relationship. He says, "I don't, 
I'm not, uh, you're not responsible for me, I'm just responsible for you. I was exposed to injustices in Bosnia, and as I was studying those injustices or human rights violations, I became involved with young activists, refugees around the world, who lived through the genocide, and somehow they kept their hearts open to the hope that telling the truth about the genocide would lead to justice. So I became caught up in, in that project, in their project. Uh, when, I, when I was arriving in Bosnia in July 2010, I learned of these exhumations taking place in Visegrad. As a result of the atrocities in Visegrad, as well as the psychological intimidation of those who were forcibly expelled, the population, the Bosnian Muslim population, was reduced from around 13,000 to around 1,000. 13,000 in 1991 to about 1,000 in 2013. And, and, and it is further, further diminishing because of people's advancing age. The, the, the victims who were murdered on this uh, famous bridge were thrown in the river. The perpetrators thought they would never be found. However, in the summer of 2010, uh, work on the dam caused the river level to drop. So the, the government you know, team knew they would have a chance to find the human remains of the victims. When the exhumation team began, they were fired on. This is the level of denial we're talking about by a gunman. And, and when, they, when they went back to uh, Sarajevo to regroup, uh, I, I had the opportunity to, to join them in the exhibition work. Uh, I felt that they were risking their lives to find the human remains of the victims, fighting to reveal the truth, and bringing some measure of closure to families. So I wanted to join them to bear witness, to document this and bear witness to the truth about the genocide. So somehow it was arranged that I would go to, the, go to Visegrad with the exhumation team when they returned after the, after the shooting. So after, this, this is uh, in August 2010, where we're uh, getting ready to go. I had the, Red Cro the medical team, the demining team, and we convoyed to, to Visegrad uh, at ICMP, that International Commission for Missing Persons. And, with, uh, and we, my, my team uh, went down this, this road to the river, and we immediately encountered uh, you know, these, these things. Uh, we, when I got to the riverbank, the, 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 the guy from the ICMP, I think it's the same person you saw in the photograph, said, Professor, listen up. We use yellow flags for the bones and orange flags for the stuff that blows up. But we ran out of yellow flags, so we used orange flags for everything. So I, I was processing this, and I just thought, you know, I just have to be careful. And, and, and then I'd been advised that we had to worry about uh, snipers and landmines the unexploded ordnance, and venomous snakes. But I was very impressed that the team worked very calmly locating and exhuming the, the, the human remains. They had great courage as they performed this sacred task. So this is, uh, so this is the kind of thing we would find both on the surface and then, so that's, some, that's me on the uh, riverbank, but I'm looking at these yellow flags wondering about them. And so I inquired, what do we have? You know, I said, innocently, what do we have here? And they said it was a digit, a tibia, and a vertebrae. And somehow this was, oh, oh, I found this somehow overwhelming. Uh, it's strange because that's what we went to find. But I was, uh, I, would, I think, as I remember it, I was kind of gasping for air. And, and in retrospect, I think I was fainting. I think that's what was. That was, I think I was just going down. And I just said to my, <laughs> I told myself, I can't go down. I have to keep filming and taking photographs. So somehow I, 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 I stayed and I was able to put these first fragments in perspective because a short distance behind me, they were uncovering six full skeletons. And this, so this is how the work was going. So thanks again to these brave young people the truth of genocide was being revealed from the uh, riverbed. 
So now about, uh, oh, so yeah, this is uh, the work of, of they, they call this the pedestal effect, where they, they ex exhume and, and have the, the bones uh, emerge. When they were uh, identified and buried, they were identified, they were to be buried in the local cemetery in 2012. And the, and the Bosnian Serb authorities threatened to destroy the memorial that had been erected at the time of the burial. This is, this is the memorial. And the local town found it uh, offensive because it refers to the victims of the Visegrad uh, genocide. So the, the, the local activists uh, asked me to uh, write a letter to the U U UN diplomat to try to save the memorial. And uh, I'm, I'm claiming here that since there's a, there's a memorial in the middle of town glorifying the perpetrators, this would be a, a, a apartheid. It would be discrimination against an ethnic group depriving them of the right to have a memorial. So that was, uh, so this was some some media coverage about this. Uh, so this is the memorial in the middle of town to the perpetrators. And we, we, we talked about that a bit earlier, so I'll move to the, uh, and, and then I organized a kind of international coalition to go to the cemetery, to the memorial, to lay flowers, to bring attention to, to this. So here, here we are in the, uh, the Muslim cemetery in Visegrad, uh, just bringing flowers to the memorial, trying to draw attention to the, to the need to save this memorial stone. So this received some, some media coverage that says genocide also happened in Visegrad. But in spite of our efforts, in, then, so that was July. In January, the uh, police broke into the cemetery and a municipal employee ground the word genocide from the memorial. So the, so here's the, here, here are the, uh, the local police, and you can see the, the employee removing the word genocide. So this, this is a kind of graphic. Uh, they said we wanted to be nice. We left the memorial, but we removed the word genocide. The uh, local activist arrived later and wrote it with a lipstick on the, to put the word back on the memorial. Uh, now, I wanted to, uh, in the interest of time, I was going to move to a, another example where uh, memorials have been prohibited. Uh, in this case, we're, in, we're back in Kalinovic, and uh, in, in Kalinovic also, there were about 1,300 Bosnian Muslims in 1991, and now there's about 50. Uh, so that's, we could call that the demographics of genocide. Uh, this is, this is the, build, the building to which the men were taken before they were taken for execution. Uh, so this, this is the inside of this, what became the concentration camp. This is a number of, a number of Pillars have some marking on them, and you can see the inside. And this, is, I'm here with uh, Samir, whose whose father was one of the victims. Now, the human remains of some 24 victims have not been found, but here, as in the case of of uh, other concentration camps in in Bosnia, the survivors have not been permitted to preserve the site, as you, which you can see is deteriorating, install a memorial, or establish a museum they would like to establish. And this is the location where, uh, this is the location where you have the uh, memorial for Ratko Mladic in the, in the nearby town. So I, I went to the site in August with, with uh, the president of the Victims Association to bear witness to the atrocity site, and then I issued a statement to the media calling on the UN diplomat who oversees the peace to ensure that the site will be preserved and the memorial will be installed. 
and this is an example of media coverage by the federal news agency there that publishes sometimes in English. So you can see Schmidt is the UN diplomat, and I'm calling on him to work with the survivors to preserve the site. But the, lo the local uh, Serb-controlled municipality won't allow the memorial to be installed. And I have one, one last example I think it's worth for today that concerns the uh, partisan sports hall in Focha. This building was the location of unspeakable atrocities in the sense that the, in, the, in the trial, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia estab established that rape was used by members of the Bosnian Serb forces here as an instrument of terror. Quote, what the evidence shows are Muslim women and girls, mothers and daughters together, robbed of their last vest vest vestiges of human dignity, treated like chattel pieces of property at the arbitrary disposal of the Serb occupation forces and at the beck and call of the three accused. So it was a campaign of persecution involving enslavement and rape. And, and it, 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 the, the verdict established such sexual violence as a crime against humanity under international law. But survivors and activists have been prevented from installing a memorial plaque at the building. So this, this is the building. I was there, uh, I, and there's no, no uh, plaque of any kind. They gather for a commemorative ceremony on the bridge. They're, they're allowed to gather on the bridge. There's the bridge nearby bridge, and they have you know, a commemorative gathering, and then they put roses in the river to remember the victims. But, and, but they're not allowed to establish the memorial. Now, just behind that building that we looked at, there's this uh, mural glorifying a, uh, a, a, a a Serb nationalist from World War II, Drajan Mihailovic. But uh, so it's a, yeah, so just, just around this corner you have that. And so, so I uh, had resolved to go, go to the building uh, to lay, to lay uh, flowers to remember the victims and protest the prohibition of a memorial. Uh, my uh, visit was, I guess, somewhat under the radar, so all went without, without uh, incident. Although, although about 10 years ago, when people went to put, put a plaque there, they were met by the police and all by, also by mobs of you know, townspeople stopping them. And uh, I made a promise to my colleagues that when we visited Partisan Hall that I would send a, a statement to the high representative who oversees the Dayton Peace Accords to encourage him to support the installation of a mo memorial here at, Partisan, uh, at the Partisan Sports Hall. Uh, so that's the promise I made to the families of, of the victims. So to, just to conclude briefly, I want to think back to Raphael Lemkin's description of the cultural dimension of genocide. He writes that the second phase of genocide involves this imposition of the national pattern of the oppressor. In other words, the imposition of the national pattern involves the memorials and monuments glorifying the perpetrators and their atrocities and the prohibition or suppression of memorials for the victims that would recognize, that would bear witness to those atrocities. Hence, the policy I've analyzed in Republika Srpska is could be seen not only as a violation of the human right to the truth and to memorialization, but a continuation of the genocide in a cultural form, asserting the right to memorialization for the survivors ensures the human right to the truth, affirms the human dignity of the victims and survivors, and, is, and resists the continuation of genocide according to the international obligation to prevent genocide. So thank you so much for your patience today and to the faculty and students at Providence College. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Professor. That was great. I really appreciate those images, that image of the uh, word genocide being 
mm. sandblasted off, that memorial is going to stick with me. A very, very powerful moment. When I listen to the talk, I think about tons of things. I think about I think about America and, 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 and Confederate monuments. I think about China. I think about all sorts of things. I think about Ukraine. I think about South Africa. There's lots of thoughts coming to my head. And one of my first questions is, how many people in here, I appreciate your witness here, how many people here hadn't heard of the genocide in Bosnia? It's a, which is no, no fault of yours. This, is, this was in the newspapers, but it was in the newspapers before you were born back when we had newspapers. It's a story. Ask one of the older people about it. They'll tell you about those things. They're interesting. Um, you remember newspapers. You do. You, yes, you're old enough to remember newspapers. Um, so I want you guys, I, 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 I really appreciate you coming and sharing this, this story, this really powerful story about what happened in Bosnia and thinking about you know, all these, the, the implications of this, of not just the genocide, but the question of memorialization. And so, now, the Humanities Forum has a tradition of starting with a question from students. So, and when we do the questions, I ask you to wait till I give this up, because we're taping this, and then the people who watch the video will be able to hear your question. But I do want to invite a student to ask a question. If you had some thoughts connected to this, This was a difficult um, talk to attend, and I came a little bit later, so I was, I was really, um, it really shook me a little bit. You spoke about Kant and um, the responsibility that we have to everyone to treat them as a means in of themselves, mm. um, and the responsibility to the truth. How do we make those two ideas compatible when dealing with those people who refuse to give up lies and um, lies about what happened in the past. How do we, where is the line that someone has committed a certain level of atrocity or evil that they're excluded from um, Kant's view that we need to treat everybody with this certain level of dignity and not collect them and send them off to a re-education camp, which is something that we might feel we, in our baser instincts that we might want to do, but we can't do that because we know it's not right. We know that's not what Kant tells us to do. So where is someone excluded from that, and how do we make this idea of the truth being this ultimate guiding force of morality and still treating those evil people with the Kantian view? Mm. Yeah, interesting question. I, uh, Professor Haynes said I had to speak about philosophy, so I brought in Kant as a, you know, as a classic example. Uh, but it's, you know, the, que the, the question is good. In other words, how, how do we, how do we uh, approach, how do we f uh, orient ourselves to the perpetrators who, uh, who, who deny, deny the genocide? And, uh, and this goes for, from the president of Bosnian Serb member of the presidency down to the, the, the mayor, of, mayor of a major city, the capital of Republika Srpska, that uh, re reject the verdicts of the International Criminal Tribunal. But I think it's, it's important to think about my, my uh, friends who are um, young people, uh, almost everybody's younger than I am these days, but they're young people who live through these things and uh, keep their hearts open to the hope that uh, telling the truth about the genocide will lead to justice, and they don't talk about revenge, they don't talk about hating the perpetrators, you know. Uh, so it's, it's about trying to establish a culture of transitional justice uh, where you would have, where you wouldn't be sending people to education camps, but the, where you would transform the environment with memorials, Museums and, uh, and the, the, the school curriculum would need to be changed. So, 
So the school curriculum in Republika Srpska is different than the curriculum in Bosnia. So kids are not learning the truth. But, but uh, the UN diplomat made a statement uh, this summer. I think not people didn't pay much attention to it, but he talked about establishing a common curriculum, which would be, a, you know, which, what, what do they call that? Uh, earth, a game changer. Is that the expression? That where, uh, where people would be exposed to the truth from an early age. So uh, I think, but I think that's what also the idea of how, how do you respond to those provocations that you, you try to develop a, a culture for, of memorialization, for example. Um, there is, there is a, a successful example in Bosnia that uh, is the model, I didn't have time to talk about it, but it's the Srebrenica Genocide Memorial Center. Be, be, because of the genocide uh, ruling, because of lobbying by the surviving mothers, the, the high representative passed a law that established the uh, memorial center at Srebrenica as a, like, a, it's like a national park. So, it's, so although it's in Republika Srpska, it's under federal control. So they have the cemetery, there's a, a, muse, a museum, memorial center, uh, museum, and they're evolving uh, exhibitions. Ch children are going to the, uh, to the museum. So it's a, it's a process of struggling for the truth. I guess that's part of my, part of my response. Uh, one, one of my friends there created or curated a uh, exhibition of survivors talking on video. As you can just lis listen to them talk about what they went through, how they survived. And an another developed a uh, exhibition about something called the Death March. Because when, when the Serbs closed in, the, uh, the, men, the men and boys who could go through the woods went, went through the woods. So they tried to recreate this, um, this experience with with uh, a, a kind of multimedia exhibition, which is really brilliant. Uh, there, is, there, there are films. There are some, they're all, all problematic, but uh, all, maybe in their, uh, the fact that they're focusing on one thing or the other, but there was a, a film nominated for the Academy Award about the Srebrenica genocide. You could try to, you could try to see. It's called Quo Vadis Aida. But, that's, but, but I think that was my, that's my effort to try to answer your very interesting question. Uh, you know, you hope, hope that education and dialogue will Im improve the culture. So I'm going to have one more question. I'm going to give it to Colin. After this question and response, I invite you to continue the conversation with us in the great room. And if you haven't been to Humanities Forum before, Please stop by the great room, even if it's just to raid the food. The food's good. It's good. It's better than Ray. I, students, cool. that that says something. So please come in. And you know, there is a way. I think Emma's question's right. That there's stuff that it would help to debrief about this, and with us, with yourselves, talk about it, think about it. This is heavy stuff that we've been talking about today. So I do, you know, come. Join us um, afterwards, but after this question. Thank you very much. I have a question about truth. Truth. Um, at some point in the talk, you mentioned that there should be or could be a human right to truth. Which, there, um, there, there is. Uh, which raises the further question, who could enforce this right, and how could one enforce it? In Western liberal democracies, at least, we don't have ministries of truth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we're not supposed to have them. <laughs> truth is supposed to result from our complex information infrastructure, which, however, as we know, has some flaws and doesn't always provide for the truth. Or as uh, I think Aristotle even said, the truth is like a barn door. Everybody can hit it, but... Uh, not everybody hits it right on target. So this raises a problem, namely, who is responsible internationally for correcting, shall we say, various political communities when they stray away from the truth? It could even be the case that tribes, 
that is tightly bound communities have an inclination to only accept those things as true which support their cohesion. Um, this seems to be fairly well documented in human history that groups that don't want to have something be true because it would threaten their status or their self-understanding, that they're pretty good at keeping that under wraps. So um, a two-part question, first of all, how to enforce the truth, and second of all, how to get groups of people who don't want the truth to accept it? Uh, good question. I, I, I was just, I thought I had the answer in my paper. I was looking for it, you know. You can find, wait, let me just find that on page 14. Uh, but, uh, well, part, one, one answer uh, I was going to give is that uh, would, be, would be represented by, the, by legislation when you have laws against Holocaust or genocide denial so that uh, someone could be prosecuted for uh, this hate, hateful denial that's inciting violence. Now, this has been, this, is hap this happens in, in, Aust in Austria. Uh, someone sent me a list of prosecutions, and and so then it, it goes to the, the court. And in most of those cases, the people were not convicted, it, it, right? They so because it was they I guess they, they they couldn't prove that it was their intent to disturb the peace, uh, or there are other mit mitigating circumstances. But this is just a practical answer to say if you're saying that that there's the truth of the Holocaust, and how do you how do you def defend that truth? And part of it would be through this, these, uh, these laws against Holocaust denial that would be adjudicated. And uh, the, the, the right to truth as a, as a human right, I, I think, was uh, motivated by people, people whose family members were, were murdered during mass atrocities, and the, 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 the people disappeared. So in a way, you, you have the right to know what happened to your loved one and the right to seek uh, uh, justice, reparations, the right to, uh, and the, uh, the, the UN documents on the right to the truth say, this is what I was reading, that, that, that society has the right to know, but the uh, societies have a responsibility to preserve the truth. So that's not a ministry, ministry of truth, but it, it would be something like uh, establishing the ICMP, the International Commission for Missing Persons. Bosnia has something called the Missing Persons Institute, and this is, this is funded, and it's their job to try to find the human remains. Uh, that's uh, that's a, a, a part. So there, there are ways to you know, fight for the truth. As I said, those people who are exhuming the remains on the riverbed in Visegrad, in, in spite of the uh, obstacles to that. We're, we're trying to preserve the truth. But I think it's a great question. It's a great question. I would like you guys to join me in thanking Professor Pettigrew for coming.